Hi friends, good evening. Welcome to the fourth episode of this video based education. So today we are going to talk about TEP repairs and this is for about standard text and also for certain different scenarios like a direct and indirect hernia and I'm going to tell you how we can deal with these cases. So without further ado, now we will just move on to the video presentation and I'll be happy to take all your questions at the end of the presentation as usual. We will start with the standard TEP repair. Generally, we should not go in the midline. We should enter to the right or left of the midline. So here we are entering into the right side, into the retrorectal space. That white sheath was the posterior rectus sheath. So now we have started the insufflation after making sure that the white sheath was seen posteriorly. And now as soon as the insufflation is started, you can see the cobweb appearance coming into the view. Once again, we see the white posterior rectus sheath and we try to stay close to it we don't go to anterior here we are just checking which is the right plane whenever there is a nice cobweb space without much of vessels or any major vessels then that is the right plane to enter in here we are using a telescopic dissection the other way of creating the space is by using a balloon but generally we prefer to use the telescope for all our TEPs and ETEP repairs so here you can see a nice big vessel which is present anterior, once again we go below that into the nice avascular cobweb space. So we are trying to enter between the two leaves of the transversalis fascia. Some tips to identify is, one, there shouldn't be any vessels running through the space. Second, the rectus muscle should not be bare, there should be a fascia which is covering it. Once again you can see we are looking anteriorly and that is the inferior epigastric vessel which is running. So now we are just trying to see where the extent lateral limit of the linea semilunaris is and we are trying to dissect the posterior rectus sheath close to that so that our working port can be made on the right side first. So like I told you we don't use the midline ports hence we don't try to attempt to dissect up to the pubis. So this is the inferior epigastric vessel running. So we have to keep that in mind use a needle for a marker on the direction in which we have to come in and then we put the first working port of IMM trocar. So through the working port, now we will use a simple hook and start dissecting. You can see in the midline, the tissue is generally slightly fused and you can see how the small facial attachment is present in the midline. So we have to divide these tissues in a sharp manner by using a scissors in a cold manner or using a hook or some instrument with a little bit of cautery. And once we incise that fused portion, then again the tissues on the opposite side also will be pretty loose and it will be a loose aerial or a plane which we have to dissect and open. So now you can see how the carbon dioxide is nicely opening up the planes and guiding us on the right way to carry our dissection. So we can continue in the same plane up to the Cooper's ligament and we can see the structures very clearly. So now you can see how the loose areola plane is on the left retrorector space. You can see the muscle quite bare. So once again we try to retain a small fascia, that's why we are not going too anterior close to the muscle, rather we are working a little lower. And here you can see as we are carrying our dissection a little more, the coopers and the pubic area would come and become more visible. Once again you can see some fat which is present that has to be retained with the anterior abdominal wall. We should not try to dissect above it. So now we are able to appreciate the Cooper's ligament and once that is under seen under vision we can just continue to carry our dissection and move towards the opposite side as well so that the entire arch of the pubic bone and the Cooper's are clearly visible. You can once again see there is a thin fascia still covering and that's why we are not able to see the Cooper's very clearly. So once that is released you can see the bone is becoming more and more exposed. So that is the pubic symphysis area. And you can see after dividing that facial attachment, everything else is loose. You can just do a blunt dissection and push off the tissues. It generally won't bleed and you can easily do a good dissection as well. And once we dissect a little more of the left retrorectal space, only then we will start to come closer towards the camera port. Now you can see we are working in the midline which is close to the port. Generally there will be a lot of fogging in this area. And you can see we are staying quite close to the rectus muscle 
on the roof we don't try to go too lower because sometimes the peritoneum might be very close and if you're not careful you can cause a small button hole in the peritoneum and that can lead to the loss of planes and make it more difficult for you so here you can see my telescope is actually inside the port that is how close to the port near the umbilicus we are working so here we don't have much space and this is the only difficult area where we have to manage and work so that we won't have too much of a problems or difficulty so here you once again you can see we're using the current in a cutting so that the dissection would be precise and not too much of smoke also would be generated so now that is the left retrorector space which is clearly visible and here you can see we are trying to feel for the indentation and see if we are ready to make the second working port also under vision so still some amount of this loose areolar tissue is left behind and we are just trying to dissect it and open up the planes so that we can have a nice vision of where the port is going to come till this step most of the time we work with a zero degree only very rarely we might have to change to a 30 degree so now we have actually started to open the lateral space of bogros on the left side you can start to appreciate the inferior epigastric on the roof and we are just working lateral to it so even this dissection can be done well with just a single instrument you don't really need an assisting hand also to do this but if you are finding some difficulty it is better to use a assisting hand so the key in TEP is always to make sure that we open up and develop all the planes which are freely available so that once we come towards the sac dissection even there is a small buttonhole in the peritoneum we won't lose the plane a big deal and if at all there is a buttonhole the options to overcome that is once you have dissected well if it's only a very small buttonhole you can just give a good head low for the patient and most of the times that would be good enough if still that is not working then either a virus needle or a 3mm port or even a 5mm port can be used in the palmas point or the right side corresponding to the palmas point so that the gas from intra abdominal can be left behind so that the space can be expanded a lot more so now you can see the area where the peritoneum is turning into the sac also is nicely visible and all this dissection has been done with just one working port we have not really made a second working port yet so till whenever we are comfortable we will carry on with our dissection like this but generally if we have opened the bogro space a little like this then we'll be more than happy with the dissection and we will go and concentrate on inserting the second port so here because the planes were very clearly visible and we didn't have too much of difficulty we are still continuing to dissect and you can see already the bogro space has been dissected quite well and you can see a nice dissected space available so that is the area of the peritoneum so now we are making the working port both these working ports are made around 1 1.5 centimeters below the level of the umbilicus on either side of the mid clavicular line because this is a bilateral hernia if it was a unilateral hernia the left working port would have been done just to the left of the midline medial to the inferior epigastric vessel so here you can see we are encountering a direct hernia and we are just reducing the hernia and pushing the transversalis pseudosac away so now you can see that whitish structure which you see is the pseudosac and we can do a nice precise dissection you don't really need cautery over here it's just your preference if you're comfortable you can use some cautery otherwise just using some instrument and pushing off the pseudosac also is good enough and that works well we will show you that technique also in another video shortly a little later in the presentation so here you can see we have come towards the end of the reduction of the hernia that is the last portion of the transversalis pseudosac which is present which we can easily push away so once again you can see the inferior epigastric is quite close and we have to keep that in the mind we should not be too careless or casual in this area then that can lead to bleeding from the inferior epigastric and whenever we see the inferior epigastric which is turning again towards the inferior aspect that means the major vessels are close by and we have to be sure that we pull the tissues away and then only dissect we should not keep it flush with the pelvic side wall and keep on dissecting a lot of the times the vein would be collapsed and we can easily nick the external iliac vein by mistake so this is the operator nerve which we are seeing on the left side so now we are further trying to open up the space on the right side and create the bogro space so one tip to open up the space is we generally try to dissect 
from close to the inferior epigastric vessel. Once again, that will be demonstrated a little later in another video so that you will understand the concept better. So here you can see how the peritoneum is tented up and being pulled close to the superficial ring. So now we are just incising the arcuate ligament attachment on the lateral aspect so that we have more space for the mesh to be seated comfortably without the upper edge of the mesh getting rolled over. So here you can see before we do this we have to make sure that the peritoneum is nicely dissected and pulled down towards the floor. If we don't do that here the peritoneum would be fused and it is very easy to nick the peritoneum at this level. So now we have created the bogros space on both sides and the retropubic space of Rizzius also has been dissected well. So only after that we are encountering the indirect portion. A direct hernia is not too much of a trouble that we won't really cause any buttonholes in the peritoneum. So after reducing the direct hernia now we have come to the parietalization to see whether any indirect component of the sac is present. If it's not present the peritoneum has to be pushed well so that the mesh can be sandwiched nicely between the pelvic side wall and the peritoneum. So here you can see we are using the cautery in a precise manner. You can see the vas is present just to the right of the instrument and here we are trying to dissect very close to it but making sure there is a good margin of safety so that we don't cause any thermal injury to the vas. So here again you can see we keep changing the traction close to the area of interest so that the pull can be good and we can do a fine precise dissection. Once again you can see how close we are working but still it's quite safe and without any difficulty we can work provided our traction is good and we identify the area where we have to work. So here you can see we are just having a little bit of thick facial attachments which we have reduced and now the vas has nicely been mobilized away from our field of dissection. So this is done till the vas turns medially and it crosses the medial umbilical ligament which is formed by the obliterated umbilical artery. So you can see the pulsation of the external iliac artery and the collapsing of the vein also very clearly. So now we are just carrying on with the parietalization and mobilizing the vessels, testicular vessels away so that the parietalization is nice and comprehensive and the mesh can be placed well without the uprolling of the lower border of the mesh which will be lifted off by the peritoneum if you don't do the dissection well and that is one of the major reasons why a recurrence would happen very soon in the postoperative period. So here you can see how we are trying to dissect even further and make sure that the peritoneum is nicely pushed away. You can see how the edge of the peritoneum is clearly visible and we just hold the edge and you just keep applying traction away so that we can see the structures well and use the cautery in a safe manner. Once again we can see how the dissection is being done and the parietalization is being carried out. We are just making sure that no facial attachments are present and all the structures are mobilized well. So now you can see how the parietalization has been done and the mobilization has been done very well as well. You can see we don't have to keep chasing for the vas. The vas will automatically come into picture. We have to take care that we stay very close to the peritoneum and flush with it. And now you can see we have done a good parietalization. Just a little more is required on the lateral aspect and if we do that the parietalization is complete and we will be ready to place the mesh very nicely over here. So now you can see how well the peritoneum has been mobilized away from the cord structures and also from the side wall of the pelvis. You can see a nice fascia which is covering the nerves. So that makes sure that the mesh doesn't come in contact with the nerves in a bare manner and you have some protection so that we don't have any chronic pain in the post-operative period. So again this loose areolar tissue which is present is dissected. So these are the nerves with the fascia on the left side. That's the external iliac artery. You can see the external iliac vein which is collapsed because of the pneumo. That is the operator nerve, a white shiny structure which we are seeing now. So this is the dissected space and a complete parietalization done. That is the vas which is forming the medial border, testicular vessels which form the lateral border of the triangle of doom. So that is the artery which is present in the triangle of doom. Generally the vein would be outside. So this is the direct hernia defect in the Hesselbach's triangle. 
which is formed by the medial uh, border of the inferior epigastric and the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscle and this is the cupus and the bones and that is the vas on the right side you can see the vein adjacent to it and the artery also medial to it and you can see the testicular vessels and this is the triangle of doom on the right side so you can see the parietalization done extensively you can see how much the peritoneum has been mobilized so that way the mesh can be placed there and the peritoneum can be pulled over the lower border of the mesh to keep it sandwiched to the side wall you can see once the dissection has been done adequately a 15 into 12 centimeter mesh can be easily placed you can see the mesh is already not crumpling a lot and you have a good working space available for you to place the mesh and this is what is called as a good landing zone and if we have this adequately in all the patients then the chance of recurrence is almost negligible so here you can see we have crossed the midline by at least a couple of centimeters uh, 2 to 3 centimeters below the level of the pubis because it was a large hernia on one side we are just anchoring the mesh mesh anchoring is either based on your principles and how you practice or in cases of when there is a very large direct hernia in order to avoid the mesh from prolapsing inside then we can definitely anchor it so here this is just a case of indirect hernia which is showing you how to dissect the indirect sac once again we identify the edge of the hernial sac you hold it with one instrument and then you slowly tease off the tissues you can see the testicular vessels and vas and all coming very close to it so you keep teasing the tissues and then we will use a short burst of cautery whenever there is a requirement so when there is a small facial attachment like this with the little bit of a branch or a vessel then you can use a short burst of cautery and again tease the testicular vessels away from our dissection once again the key is to make sure that we stick very close to the peritoneal sac and here we have tried to encircle the sac this is how generally we perform the indirect hernia dissection so that it just gives us a good sense of safety and we do not have to be worried about the pass at all we can just enlarge the space in this case because it was a incomplete indirect hernia we were able to reduce the entire sac and you can see we are able to divide the last final fibrotic attachments and then the sac is complete if it's a complete sac then we can use a ligature like how we are showing it now and you can do a intracorporeal suturing so this port position is one of uh, the main advantages is you can have a good triangulation and do a laparoscopic knotting and suturing similar to how we would do it in any other uh, laparoscopic surgery because you have a good triangulation or the other option would be to just hold the sac with your left hand a big atraumatic instrument incise the sac distally and then apply an endo loop immediately that also would work because this is only done at the end of the dissection and you have already created the plane swell so this is a large direct hernia where we are just reducing the pseudo sac without any energy but we have to keep changing the traction closer to the area of the pseudo sac so that the traction would be very good and we can just tease the pseudo sac away you can see when a slider is present like the bladder being the content then this is a very safe way of reducing the hernia rather than trying to use any form of energy and you can see that is the end of the reduction of the direct hernia on this side so we move on to the next step of the video which is the extended step here we are identifying the umbilicus that is the pubic bone and just lateral to the umbilicus and around 2 cm above it that is the area where we would make our incision and gain an open entry into the retrorectus space since i am a right handed surgeon and this patient had a large right hernia so that is the anterior rectus sheath seen very clearly so we are making the incision on the opposite side of the hernia on the left of the patient so this incision has to be made sure that it is medial to the semilunar line so now we are just using the artery to open the space and now we are retracting the muscle and you can see the retrorectus space that's the posterior rectus sheath and this is the rectus muscle which was just retracted and then we use the trocar without the operator into the space bluntly we just uh, place a saline soaked gauze in that area and we just put a suture and we take the suture in between the port and the gauze in such a manner when we tie it it would be air tight and reduce any possible leakage of air happening from this area 
the other advantage of putting this port is to secure it to the troca ch uh, gas channel as well so that the port doesn't come out accidentally so this is done in all our teps and eteps so now under vision we insufflated the gas you could see how the space started opening up the first thing we would want to do is identify the posterior rectus sheath similar to a tep repair and then we can carry our dissection in a telescopic manner and whenever we do the telescopic dissection it should be in a forward backward movement and no sweeping motion here you can see the rectus is slightly bare so once again we identify the posterior rectus sheath and we dissect close to it so this is the key and we make the working port you can see the inferior epigastric well and here we have to take care that we dissect well below the inferior epigastric and make sure that it stays in the roof if the inferior epigastric is brought to the floor by mistake then the entire surgery would be confusing and difficult for us to perform so the first step is to make sure that the inferior epigastric is again taken to the roof similar to how we are doing it now the major advantage with the etp is that you have a very wide space and the possibility of a peritoneal injury is quite low because you have a good distance of the posterior rectus sheath available for you to initially create the space so whenever you are in the initial learning curve etp is a good procedure to perform so now if you look carefully there are two planes which we can work on this is the right plane which i am working on right now but my telescopic dissection initially was done in the wrong plane this is a drawback of the telescope you can see just above my instrument there is a fascia and above the fascia the telescope had gone so that is the wrong plane so this is the one layer of transversalis fascia which i pushed with my hook and the other layer is below my hook and we are dissecting between the two layers and you can see how avascular it is and just a blunt dissection is enough to open up the space so that is the pubic symphysis and the cooper's ligament seen clearly once that space is open then we come to the midline here there was lot of fat in this patient because of the visceral obesity and here you can see how much of energy is required to really take down this fibrous attachment in the midline so this is what we were trying to emphasize on the conventional tep as well in etp it is even better visualized and i've deliberately selected this case so that the fat is more and you can see how much of a dissection is really required sometimes to put the working port the second working port so here you can see we just using the contrary once again and we are doing the dissection in a sharp manner we have to take care that we don't come and dissect too much lower then there is a possibility of injuring the peritoneum and causing button holes to it so we have to work towards the roof leaving only a small rim of the fatty tissue all over there and once this fat is brought down the right retrorectal space would be visible to us and we can continue with our dissection in that area so now you can see the fat has been taken down well so we are just trying to identify the area where the posterior rectus sheath is getting inserted into the linea alba so this will happen close to the umbilicus so because we know that from around 2 cm below the umbilicus you don't have any posterior rectus sheath it's deficient so here we have to just dissect the posterior rectus sheath and see it we don't essentially require to incise the po posterior rectus sheath insertion like we do it for ventral hernias when we do a etep rs but sometimes when the umbilical port is very close and you need a comfortable working space then i am just going to demonstrate in this case how to incise the insertion of the posterior rectus sheath into the linea as well so from the roof around 1 and 1/2 to 2 cm away we are just identifying the spot and now we are just trying to dissect a little more fat and you can see we are not able to see anything beyond that so here we can see a little more fat which is present and we are just dissecting once again close to the roof and not on the inferior aspect if you go inferior then we'll definitely cause button holes to the peritoneum and that would really make your surgery a lot more difficult and in etep there is not too much of a dissection which is done which is unnecessary except a 3 to 4 cm of the retrorectal space but that definitely is not too harmful and it's not going to add to the morbidity of the patient as well so during the initial curves of tep repair a uh, etep definitely makes your life much more easier so here we just demonstrating how to incise the posterior rectus sheath you can see we are incising it in a sharp manner and we are going to use the cautery also well over there so now you can see we are able to identify the fat lot more clearly over the area where we have incised the posterior rectus sheath and we are just continuing to use the cautery and 
push the fat down. So again, just a simple monopolar in a hook is good enough or you can use a Maryland or a scissors as well. It is depending on your comfort. We generally like the hook because it's a low profile instrument and cost effective as well for us to carry a safe dissection for the patient. So now you can see this is the last of the fat which is present in the midline. Once this is taken down, automatically the right rectus space would be open. So here we are incising the second working port in the umbilicus. So this is the first camera port, the second working port which is in the umbilicus. And this is the first working port which we made in the left side, on the left midclavicular line. So once again, this is the inferior epigastric vessels. So you go close to the vessels and open up with both your instruments. This is the safe way of opening the Bogro space without causing any injury to the peritoneum. So you can see how the movement of my instruments are. This is a very good movement which you can apply in TEP repairs to open up the space in a blunt fashion without much of a worry of injury to any structures. You can see now the Bogro space is becoming more pronounced and gradually we are still going in and opening up the space. You can see I have already identified the edge of the peritoneum and we are still opening up and widening the space. So that once the space is wide then we can come to do the dissection. So now we have deployed the mesh and you can see the amount of space which is available in an EETEP repair. The rest of the dissection is similar to TEP repairs and once you place the mesh you see the upper border very clearly and you can see the distance of free dissected space also available. So this is the major advantage of ETEP repairs. So next we move on to briefly talk about SIL step. TEP is a good area where we can do a SIL surgery. Here we have used the SILS platform because right from the beginning you have two instruments available for your dissection which makes it easy for you to open the plane in a nice atraumatic blunt fashion. So this movement again is good enough. You reduce the hernia similar to how we would do it in a multiport TEP repair. All the principles have to be adhered to. That is the most important. There is no point doing an inadequate dissection and saying I did a hernia repair in TEP rep in a single incision manner. So this is the final disse uh, dissection and this is the indirect sac also which is being dissected. Now you can see the triangle of doom very nicely visible. That is the vas. This is the testicular vessels. You can see the external iliac vein through the dissected area. That is the direct hernia also which is seen. It's a quite a large direct hernia uh, with a pantaloon component, uh, indirect hernia as well. So all this can be done well with a cells. And this is the right side hernia which was dissected indirect. And you can see it was a bilateral indirect inguinal hernia which was done well with cells. There are some troubleshootings which can occur in TEP repairs. One major thing which I earlier mentioned is about the inferior epigastrics. So here if you look at the video very closely, this is the inferior epigastric which is brought to the floor. So the surgeon has done a mistake by bringing it to the floor and you can see how it is lying in the floor. So this is a bad dissection. So we had to show him the right space. So this is the right space which he's identified and dissecting now after telling him. So you have to always stick to the posterior rectus sheath and not go to anterior and bare the rectus muscle. If there is a buttonhole in the peritoneum, you can apply an endo loop very easily like how we are doing it right now so that you don't lose the space too much. Or you can even do an intracorporeal suturing if you're using the lateral ports like how I showed you now. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you once again, friends, for joining me for this fourth presentation on TEP repairs. I hope you enjoyed it. I think there were a few questions which we answered in the YouTube itself. So until we meet next time, stay safe. So probably the next time we'll try to do ventral hernias and we'll probably talk about laparoscopic eye palm. If the videos are short or not much to add in only eye palm, then probably I'll try to combine with ETEP RS. If it's quite long, then we'll probably put ETEP RS as a separate video presentation. Once again, all of you stay safe until we meet the next time. Thank you once again for your support. We will start with the standard TEP repair. Generally, we should not go in the midline. We should enter to the right or left of the midline. So here we are entering into the right side, into the retrorector space. That white sheath was the posterior rector sheath. So now we have started the insufflation after making sure that the white sheath was seen posteriorly. And now as soon as the insufflation is started, you can see the cobweb appearance coming into the view. 
once again we see the white posterior 